Um, I have been here before, um, it was about 40 years ago. Um, so it just shows that uh, I must have been underrated at that time because it's taken 40 years to call me back. But, uh, anyway, it was in the days of Mr. Dean and uh, a great man of God, I remember. Anyway, um, this evening I've been tasked with two things. And it, it may be this evening that it will be uh, an excursion um, because what I want to do is, and I've been asked to do, is to give you an introduction to the Minor Prophets, uh, a short introduction, and then I'm going to um, take you through the Prophet Amos. So you will need your Bibles open at the Prophet Amos, because I will take you through it. You may feel it's going to be a long haul, but uh, hopefully I will finish, well, I will try to finish on time. Uh, the brother did ask me if I had a PowerPoint presentation. I said, yes, I did, but um, uh, it would take far too long this evening. Um, so uh, you just have to uh, bear with me this evening. Um, I want to read, first of all, from the prophet Amos, just to give you an introduction to the minor prophets. Amos chapter 3, please, and verse 7. And then if you keep your Bibles open at Amos, uh, then we will um, traverse uh, the prophet Amos this evening. Amos chapter 3, then in verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In Amos chapter 3, there are a series of rhetorical questions invoking cause and effect. Situations, for instance, in verse three it says, "Can two walk together except they be agreed?" Um, verse six says, "Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord have not done it?" Those are rhetorical questions. The answer uh, from three to six is no on every occasion. And the implication of verse seven is that God had a unique relationship with the Old Testament prophets by providing them with an understanding of his intimate plans for the future. But this text, uh, Amos 3, 7, should not be interpreted as if God was constrained or circumscribed by the prophets, i.e. he does nothing at all without telling the prophets. It simply reflects the fact that when God contemplated judgment in the Old Testament against humanity in general, or his own people, Israel in particular, he exhibits his mercy before sending destruction by revealing his intentions through the prophets so that men and women might repent, thus reflecting uh, the long suffering of a gracious God. The writer to the Hebrews, of course, uh, changes the dynamic by displacing the prophets with a one-liner almost, uh, with a revelation of his son as the final message uh, to men. God has spoken in son. There is no indefinite or definite article before the word son. So God has spoken in son. In other words, our Lord Jesus Christ is the final revelation of God to men. So bearing this uh, in mind, we now turn to a quick survey of the minor prophets. Now, for um, most believers here, I suspect that you are already uh, au fait with the uh, collection of 12 prophetic books called the Minor Prophets. I'll just go quickly through them. Uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, um, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And these books in our English Bible follow the order that's found in the Masoretic text. That is the text of the uh, Masoretes, who from the 6th to the 10th century uh, put together a revised Hebrew text. In fact, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered um, in 1947, uh, every um, Old Testament book uh, had uh, was found apart from the book of Esther and in that um, uh, collection 
uh, the um, 12 minor prophets were found in one continuous scroll. So they have always been together in Judaism and they've always been together in the word of God. The Septuagint, that is the Greek Old Testament, uh, which is uh, a document around uh, 285 BC, has a slightly different order, but nonetheless includes all these 12 books. In Jewish tradition, the collection of these books is known as the Book of the Twelve, and they were generally placed, as I've said, in one continuous scroll. And it's the patristic writer Augustine of Hippo who was first to use the term the Minor Prophets to describe these 12 prophetic books. And this has been the conventional title used by Christians ever since. When you refer to the Minor Prophets, that's what we are talking about. But in many ways, this is an unfortunate title uh, used for these books because Augustine and other um, Christian writers were simply referring to the relatively small size of each book, even though um, uh, Hosea and Zechariah, of course, are longer than the major book, Daniel. But by using the word minor, it can also imply that the books are in some way or other not that important compared with major prophetic books. But to relegate these books to the shadows of biblical studies is an indication that many do not see the relevance of these prophecies to today's world. While these books do contain historical narratives contributed to our understanding of God's dealing with various nations in the ancient Near East, especially Israel and Judah, during critical periods of their history, they also contain important prophecies relating to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the end time. So they are, to use that wonderful theological word, they are eschatological. They have to do with the end times. Moreover, they have many practical lessons to teach us as believers today. And anyone who turns from reading the minor prophets, simply hearing only the words of recrimination and judgment has not actually read them objectively. Within the bleak events often described by these prophets, lurks the mighty hand of God. And beyond these events is the bright prospect of a kingdom inaugurated by one, even our Lord Jesus Christ, whom Zechariah portrays as suffering betrayal, piercing and eventual death. So the minor prophets are not time bound as we may think. And there is therefore tremendous profit to be gained in studying these prophetic books, even if on times, the various forms of text may be difficult to understand and interpret. The 12 prophets are not based upon any chronological scheme or consideration, but generally represent God's dealings with Israel and Judah during the period of the kings and the post exile period, coming the restoration of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the second temple. In, second, in simple terms, these 12 prophetic books um, could be simply divided into three units of biblical history, before, during, and after the Babylonian exile. And the grasp of the historic background, and I encourage everyone here this evening, particularly as you're later going to be studying uh, the post-exilic prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and also earlier prophets, uh, Jonah and Obadiah, that particularly with regard to uh, these prophets, um, you read uh, the accounts of the history of Israel and the division of the kingdom in 1 Kings chapter 12, where you have the division of the kingdom and 10 tribes go to the north with Jeroboam the first, and the southern kingdom of Judah with uh, Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites. And that is critical to our understanding of these uh, prophetic books. And of course, with the major books as well. Also, when you come to the post-exile books of Haggai, Zechariah, 
you need to read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So the exercise for you, the homework for you next week or next uh, month is to actually read the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, and go down to 2 Kings chapter 25. And once you get that into your mind, you can then shape where the prophets fit in. And you can understand not only the historical background, but much of the genre within those books and what they're alluding to in terms of biblical interpretation. Now, most of the prophets are fairly um, conventional. Uh, they open all with its own superscription, a short narrative, introducing the prophet's identity, and in most cases, the historical background to the prophecy. And additional information is provided <coughs> about the genre of the writing and the major concern of the prophets. In several of these books, the personal history, the circumstances of the individual prophet is used by God to illustrate the salient point of the prophecy. For example, in seeking to restore a backsliding nation, God uses a metaphor depicting the marital relationship between the prophet Hosea and his wife Gomer. Again, by narrating the story of the prophet Jonah, God's patience and long suffering towards even Gentiles is explained and articulated. Uh, even a Jew cannot understand the wonder of the long suffering of God. Um, and yet that's what Jonah is really all about. Now, some of the major themes that you can extrapolate from these 12 books is the importance of Israel and Judah maintaining their covenant relationship with God. But secondly, what you find exemplified in these 12 prophets is the election of Israel and God's kingship through his son, Jesus Christ. And also what you see is the sovereignty of God over nations. Even though God chose one, according to Deuteronomy chapter seven, even though God chose one specific nation to be his peculiar and precious treasure, he is still all what he'd always been before, the God of the nations. And he holds nations to account. Also, what you find in these prophets are the social justice and righteousness, the significance of the day of the Lord, and particularly in Amos, we have the first incident of the day of the Lord in chapter 5, and it's a significant occurrence in the prophet Amos. We also have the first and second comings of our Lord Jesus Christ, particularly exemplified again in the prophet Zechariah, and I know Daniel will deal with that, uh, um, I think in January sometime. And also what you have is the hope of the restoration of the temple and, of course, ultimately the millennial temple and a future kingdom with an emphasis upon a faithful remnant in Israel. What's interesting, of course, as you compare and contrast these minor prophets is that they start with Hosea, who portrays God figuratively as the husband and Israel as the wife whom he divorces because of her infidelity to the covenant. But in the last book, Malachi, God condemns divorce and encourages Israel to hold firm to the Mosaic covenant. Throughout the prophets, major and minor, the significance of the law is emphasized and re-emphasized. So these are the minor prophets and they are important pieces of Old Testament books, literature, and something that you need to get your mind around because they have significance for today. You're going to be looking at the three um, post-exile prophets um, and then uh, Jonah, I think, and Obadiah, important books in the Old Testament. So I think uh, probably I could say a lot more, but We'll move on to Amos. So will you turn, please, with me to the book of Amos again? And I want to read from the beginning of Amos, chapter 1, verse 1. Sorry, could someone get me a glass of water? Sorry. Mm, thanks. Amos, chapter 1, and verse 1. 
The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. Now chapter five, please, and verse 24. Chapter 5 and verse 24. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The book of Amos is set in the 8th century BC. Amos was a contemporary of Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, and possibly Jonah but he didn't necessarily prophesy at the same time. He prophesied as indicated in verse one, in the day of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, that's Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Amos's name means burden, but as we will discover, he was not burdened down by the task before him. We're also informed that it was two years before the earthquake which according to archeological findings was around 760 BC. It was clearly a memorial, a, a memorable event in the nation's history, as it is again referred to in Zechariah chapter 14, verse five, where it prefigures the way in which Mount Olivet will be split in two by Christ as he stands on that mountain. Verse two constitutes an introduction to the book of Amos and produces the main theme of the book, which is a prophecy against Israel. It's one of the most powerful introductions in scripture. You can in fact compare it with Joel chapter three, verse 16. God is depicted here as a rampant lion about to bounce on his prey. And he thunders with such devastation that pastures where sheep graze will languish and the summit of Mount Carmel will wither. Such will be the ferocity of God's anger towards Israel for their sins. The fact that God chooses to roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem indicates that he finds fault with the northern kingdom of Israel. So we're looking at the Northern Kingdom of Israel. But what accounts for this judgment? Why has God taken issue with the Northern Kingdom? The decline of the Syrian empire and the Egyptian empire enabled Jeroboam II of Israel to extend his kingdom and fully recover land taken by foreign invaders. Providentially, Jeroboam's stronger neighbors were weak at that time, and he seized his opportunity with genius. He was a strategist of a genius kind. He arranged trade and military agreements, which brought in wealth and ensured stability. According to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, Jeroboam II restored the territory of Israel from Libo Hamath, to the Sea of the Arabah in accordance with the promise that God had made through the prophet Jonah. So in other words, this was a man who went and restored the kingdom of Israel back into the days of not Solomon, but David. And this resulted in an unprecedented period of prosperity for Israel. Thus the older homogeneous economic structure of Israel gave way to sharp distinctions of wealth and privilege. Social injustice and decadence became an everyday occurrence in Israel. But Israel, however, still scrupulously observed religious practices, but it was altogether superficial and meaningless. In other words, it was form without substance. 
they were simply going through the motions of tradition, a matter of mere routine. And living in such an affluent society, they failed to appreciate that moment by moment existence depended totally on the living God. They didn't deny God's existence, but they lived as if he didn't exist. And Israel's prosperity was taken by them to be evidence of God's favor. And they just assumed that they were living in a way that pleased him. They thought that the doctrine of election meant that because they were the chosen people of God, he would automatically see that they prospered and not bring them to account for their sin. In other words, they interpreted the doctrine of election as favoritism and that they were under his protection, irrespective of how they live and what they did. But because of their covenant relationship with God, Israel had knowledge about God that no other people had. They were accountable to the living God. And this meant that they knew what pleased God and what displeased him. And they were expected to conduct their lives in the light of that revealed knowledge. And what underpins this relationship was the inviolable principle that greater light brought greater responsibility and greater judgment because they were his people. Israel's complacency, therefore, made them ripe for judgment. And Amos is the man chosen by God to pronounce this judgment. So Amos is a prophet of judgment. In a New Testament parallel, Peter provides us with a salutary warning as well on a similar, in a similar context. In his first letter, chapter 4, verse 17, he says that the time will come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it starts with us, then what shall be the end of those who obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner appear, the ungodly appear? So Amos has a very contemporary value for us today. And we should take heed of the warnings of this inspired prophet. Israel failed to allow their knowledge of God to affect the way that they live. They thought they were impervious to the judgment of God. Their behavior should have reflected God's character. And so it is with us today. Failure on their part to comply with God's word led to judgment and provides a salutary warning to us that there needs to be a direct correlation between what we preach and what we practice as Christians. You cannot live as you please if you're a Christian. You cannot do contrary to the word of God and think that God will not judge you. And that's precisely the delusion of Israel. It thought its prosperity, its riches, <coughs> was the electing grace of God. In fact, it turned out to be their own arrogance and brought judgment upon them. Amos himself was a shepherd breeder from Tekoa, a small town in Judah, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. The Hebrew word translated sheep breeder in chapter one, verse one, and in chapter seven, verse 14, only occurs in one other place in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 4, where it refers to Misha, king of Moab. Scholars believe that the Hebrew word for sheep breeder um, refers to a breed of small sheep which could be sold because of its excellent wool and was much sought after, not only in Israel, but in Judah and the surrounding countries. So he was, in all probability, a relatively uh, well healed individual, but he also had a second source of income from tending sycamore trees. Certain kinds of sycamore trees in Palestine produce figs, and growers help the figs to ripen by piercing them with a short, for, uh, a short time before they harvest. In other words, it would enable the fruit to develop, to fructify. Although Amos grew up in Judah, and was not a prophet by vocation. He is called upon by God to take a message of judgment 
to the Northern Kingdom of Israel, which was enjoying a renaissance under Jeroboam II. Amos found himself engaged in a particularly difficult work, a southerner ministering to the North, a countryman facing the sophistication of the nobility and professional priesthood, a prophet of doom to an age which felt comfortable and secure in its own materialism. But I want to emphasize this point this evening. This man, Amos, was no rustic. And as you read through the book that bears his name, you're immediately struck by the extent of his knowledge of history and geography, topography, economics, and above all, his ability to apply the word of God to every given situation. He was no amateur theologian, but a man who had thoroughly immersed himself in the word of God, as is evident from his considerable knowledge of the Lord Moses. If you look through the prophet Amos, you will see his constant reference to the Lord Moses. Um, oh, that we had men and women uh, today in our assemblies like that. Okay, let's go into the prophecy itself then. It can be divided into four parts, and what I will do is take you through each part and then draw the threads together at the end. So the first section is chapter 1, verse 3 to 2, 6d. Verse 6 of chapter 2, thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn the punishment thereof, because they sowed the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes or a pair of sandals. Now, <clears throat> imagine a southerner, and he's going north, he's from Judah, and he's going to Israel. And he has a message from God, which he knows is not going to be particularly welcome by the northern kingdom. How does he engage these northern uh, Jews, how does he engage with this northern kingdom? And so most commentators suggest that he went to the marketplace where he uh, knew uh, how to trade, where he probably sowed his wool in the past. And he gathers together an audience around him. He needs to engage with that audience. That is the target audience for Amos, the people of Israel. But what he does, he doesn't immediately direct his guns at Israel. What he does is to gain the attention of the people of Israel by denouncing all the nations around them, including his own nation, Judah. So he starts with Syria for three transgressions of Damascus of before. And he goes all the way through the nations around Israel. And each one, he uses the same prescribed formula. Thus saith the Lord, an introduction, an indictment for three transgressions or three crimes of before against each nation. The punishment decree, I will send fire, which usually means in a biblical sense, he will send forces or armies against that country. And the conclusion is, saith the Lord. And those are, apart from uh, slightly different for Israel, but those are the prescribed form that are used by the prophet in respect of these countries around him. The numerical reference, three transgressions and four, was a way of saying that the limit had been passed. God is holding these nations around uh, Israel to account. Three was enough, but four was beyond what could be endured. Four was the last straw. Now, if you notice, the first six judgments are against, first of all, Syria for savage cruelty, Philistia. The name Gaza appears here. Um, just to uh, make you aware that this is the country of Philistia in biblical terms. Um, Palestine, or the Palestinians, are not Philistine. They're not linked to Felicia. And they are condemned for slave trading. Phoenicia for slave trading and 
treaty breaking, Edom for revenge without mercy, Ammon for sadism, and Moab for violent and vindictive hatred. Now notice these first six nations, the first three of them are not blood relatives of Israel, whereas the next three are. So you have these six nations which are condemned. And you can imagine the crowd around Amos cheering on every occasion for three transgressions of Syria, Damascus, and for four, for three transgressions of this and that and the other. And you can imagine the crowd cheering. And then Amos turns his attention to his own countrymen, Judah. They are condemned for idolatry and contempt for the word of God. And you can imagine the people of Israel cheering even louder. Why? Because they hated Judah. And this must have been an exceedingly difficult thing for Amos to do. But God's will is more important to him than even his own national identity. So he has captured his audience attention. He has pulled the noose tight around Israel. He has got them into the news. And now he turns attention to Israel. And suddenly he exclaims, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn the punishment thereof because they sowed the righteous with silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. And what you have from that verse and onwards in the rest of chapter two is the indictment against Israel for the crimes that they have committed. Notice after verse six, and then the other multiple infractions of the law, including abuse of the poor, immorality, idolatry, and drunkenness, further outlined in verses 7 to 16. These infractions by God's own people brought a great suffering to God himself. Notice the expression used in verse 13 of chapter 2. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheep. You see, God feels like this cart being pressed down because of the sins of the people of Israel. Do we ever consider how much God suffers when we sin and fail to comply with his word? Now notice that Judah and Israel are condemned for covenant infractions. In other words, for breaking the law of God. Their neighbors are condemned for violating basic norms of decency. And just come back and think about that again. All nations are directly accountable to God. The sovereign God holds them all accountable. But the nation of Israel, Judah and Israel in this context, are accountable to God because of divine revelation. And we are accountable to God, of course, because of divine revelation. Okay, let's go to the second part, then. That's the first part. The second part, judgments against Israel. This goes from chapter 3 to chapter 6, verse 14. And I'll just read verse 1 of chapter 3. Hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you. For all your iniquities. Although the northern kingdom of Israel is the target audience, nonetheless, Judah is including in the opening two verses of chapter three because it reveals the intimate relationship of God to, uh, of Israel to God. Both nations represent the whole family that came up out of Egyptian bondage. Now, chapter three to six divides into three addresses or sermons. Notice Chapter 3, verse 1, hear this word. Chapter 4, verse 1, hear ye this word. Chapter 5, verse 1, hear this word. Amos' entrapment exercise has listed Israel as right for God's judgment. And the prophet now sets out the basis for Israel's guilt and why God is prepared to punish his own people. These three chapters outline the cause and 
consequences of that decision. Each unit therefore deals with judgment. Um, chapter 3, 1 to 15, the prophet sets out the nature and the ground of the Lord's quarrel with, Egypt, uh, with Israel. Election brings greater responsibility and therefore greater judgment for those who ignore God's word. All the material things that Israel valued, such as their palaces and great houses, God would bring down, as well as destroying their false altars at Bethel. Listen to the indictment of God in verse 10 of chapter 3. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. So there was oppression, dishonesty, crime, and violence. It sounds like a description of our decadent society, does it not? But even in this situation, there is the prospect of a remnant being saved. Notice what he talks about. He talks about the fact that a sheep, when a lion is finished with it, there is a small part of it left. Not much of Israel will be left when the Assyrian hordes later destroyed the northern kingdom. But something will be left, a remnant. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, Amos points out in this address that despite past punishment for wickedness and godliness, godlessness, Israel had not turned and not repented. Notice that chapter 4 is punctuated with this cry. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Notice what he says. I have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places. Yet ye have not returned unto me. So God brought in famine, natural disaster, and yet Israel failed to grasp the punishment of the judgment of God. Yet ye have not returned unto me. And this is punctuated throughout this fourth chapter. And notice the famous then text, which is often used in uh, the gospel. Therefore, verse 12, thus will I do unto your Israel, because I do this unto thee, unto you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So God brought about natural disaster in Israel to try to bring them back to himself. And yet they still failed to return unto the Lord. And so there would be a meeting with God himself. Now, uh, chapter the third address, chapter 5, 1 to 6, 14, um, and it's divided by the penetrating cry in chapter 6, verse 1, woe to them that are in ease in Zion. In these two chapters, we get to the root of Israel's departure from God and her need to repent and return to God. God declares Israel to be a fallen virgin who has no hope for the future without true repentance and restoration. The society of Israel was characterized in those days by those who were very rich and those who were very poor. The rich exploited the poor, yet still remained scrupulously attached to their religious practices and were anxious to celebrate feasts and pay their vows simply going through the motions of formalism. In fact, you can read in chapter eight, they couldn't get the Sabbath and the new moon celebrations over quickly enough to continue trading. And because of their concern to make more profit, they cheated people by using false balances. They made the ephah small and the shekel great and falsified the balances by the sea. And all their time, their hearts were far away from God. They cared little for justice and righteousness and perverted the course of justice by bribery and corruption. They ignored the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 by not loving the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their might, nor did they feel in any way obligated to comply with Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 that they should love their neighbour as themselves. Uh, our Lord reminds us in Luke 10, of course, uh, who our neighbour is, uh, primarily anyone in need. Now, in chapter 6, verse 1, there's an interesting um, 
comment, woe to those at ease in Zion. And in chapter one, he, Amos now brings his guns to bear on the leaders of Israel. As far as they were concerned, everything was rosy. There was a rising gross national product, trade and military alliances guaranteed continued success and prosperity. Their philosophy of life was that God had blessed them with the good life, so why should they enjoy it to the full? But their sense of security was false. Leadership among God's people is not just about privilege and status. It brings with it responsibility. What the leaders of Israel failed to do was to provide a moral compass by example to the nation, to express any concern for the many people in their society who were less fortunate and who were in real need. And they couldn't come to terms with the corrosive effect of prosperity and warn others of the special dangers associated with wealth. Notice what Amos says in chapter six, verse eight, to paraphrase it, they were not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. And as leaders of God's people, we need to be cautious and careful about the things that might affect the local church. These leaders took their eye off the ball and failed to give a moral lead to their people. In fact, the irony of all this was that they desired the day of the Lord, thinking that it would be a day of rescue and blessing for them, whereas Amos warns them that it would be a day of judgment for Israel. Put another way, Amos declares that the virgin of Israel was dead. So it would be a funeral, not a coronation. Notice what it says in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. You see, Israel thought that the day of the Lord would be a day of light for them. Notice what it says. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. How ironic. Or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and the serpent bit him. How ironic again. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? So here were people who desired the day of the Lord, irrespective of the fact that they lived their lives in complete ignorance to the God who sustained them by, by, by his promises from day to day. And no one who understood the character of God revealed at Mount Zion would welcome a meeting with him. And of course, we as believers look for the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a vivifying hope that is. However, we should also bear in mind the judgment seat of Christ. Are we going to be ashamed on that day of review and suffer loss of reward? You see, we often talk about the coming of the Lord and say how wonderful it will be. But we might be ashamed on that day of review and suffer loss. Are our lives? compatible with the word of God? Do we live our lives as if God did not exist? We say we are Christians. We say we gather with the Lord's people. But what about our lives? Are we simply going through the motions of tradition in our Christian lives like these men were, these men and women, and delight more in material things than we do in the things of God? The prophecy of Amos warns us against the danger of simply going through the motions of religious observances and of being socially unjust in our dealings with others. And these are warnings, brethren. They're not just time war, these prophets. They speak to us today. And we need, of course, to have lives that are in compliance with the word of God, that what we believe we live out from day to day so that we are not seen as those who say one thing and do something else. And then chapters seven to nine, five visions are now brought before us with a short biological parenthesis in chapter seven. Amos has a vision of locusts attacking growing vegetation, and that would be completely disastrous for the nation of Israel. 
Um, Amos intercedes and judgment is averted. He then has a second vision of fire uh, consuming the same vegetation. Again, he intercedes and judgment is averted. So on the face of it, when we come to chapter seven, it seems that God may be actually changing his mind about judging Israel. But this is quickly ruled out by the third vision, the vision of a plumb line. And the plumb line, of course, represents the requirement of the nation by God as Israel is out of plumb or out of kilter with the word of God. She does not measure up to God's standard any longer. And like a building, she is unsafe and should be demolished. And the prophecy is now pronouncing the destruction of the altars and religious sanctuaries of Israel, and it is directed at the house of Jeroboam. In other words, judgment has been temporarily averted, but now, it's guaranteed because of the plumb line. And this immediately brings Amos into conflict with the priest Amaziah, who is in Bethel. And he accuses Amos of treason or sedition. It's interesting to note that the same allegations are made against our Lord. Why was our Lord crucified? Because of the claim of sedition because he made himself a king. It's interesting to note that his followers, including the Apostle Paul, were also indicted for the same thing. Paul, Acts chapter 17 at Thessalonica, what happened? He was preaching another Caesar. So here is an indictment which is not exclusive to the Old Testament. It is an indictment which is always brought against the people of God. And Amos responds by painting an even darker picture of God's judgment. Jeroboam would die by the sword and Israel would go into captivity. And within a very short period of time, the Assyrian hordes would besiege Israel, Samaria, and destroy it. And it would never come back again. The 10 tribes would be lost completely. And Jeroboam would die by the sword and Israel would go into captivity. And in this dramatic exchange between Amos and Amaziah, Amaziah accuses Amos of being a mercenary. He says, you're trying to ply your trade as a seer in Israel rather than your home state of Judah. Amos is quick in his response and hard hitting. He presents his credentials as one who had been called to carry out his prophetic ministry to Israel, even though he was not a prophet by birth or by training. He was a man sent from God, to use that um, phrase from John chapter 1, verse 7. Just as John the Baptist was a man sent from God, so this man was sent by God. And in the debacle that follows, Amaziah forbids him from prophesying. But Amos has no alternative but to prophesy and bring judgment on Amaziah as well in his own house. You see, he must obey God rather than man. And this forms the basis of the remaining two further visions in chapter 8 and 9. The basket of summer fruit or figs and the vision of the Lord standing by the altar. Now, in chapter 8, when we come to the basket of summer fruit or figs, there is a play on words in the Hebrew text because the word for fruit has a similar sound to the word for N. Thus, one could say that this is a picture of the finality of judgment, not simply that Israel was ripe for judgment and would be carried away as fruit in a basket, but that no further time would be allowed by God. So this is the end for Israel. The basket full of figs, summer fruits, meant that God was going to dispose completely of Israel. 
Israel's lack of spiritual desire is also identified in chapter eight in the way in which they prioritize their lives. Since they live without compliance to God's word, we have in chapter eight the ultimate sanction of God to withdraw his word from Israel. And this silence of God is compared by Amos to a famine where people desperately search for the word of God as one would search for food or water. So you can imagine the concern of people. They couldn't find the word of God any longer. They couldn't hear the word of God. God was silent. I think it was uh, Sir Robert Anderson who once said that the greatest mystery in the universe was the silence of God. And this is a statement, an indictment against Israel. God had stopped speaking to his people. Their search would be in vain and the nation would fall to rise no more. And we have in chapter nine, God, the Lord at the altar, bringing down judgment upon Israel. And you might say, well, is that the end? Is that curtains for Israel? Well, no, it's not. Because in chapter nine, we have a statement concerning Israel. When Israel repents, ultimately, it would be planted again in their own land, never to be uprooted again. And a millennial kingdom would be one day established, which would include the presence of believing Jews and Gentiles. It would be the fulfillment of Acts chapter 15, verses 15 to 17. So although this is a prophet of doom, although there are indictments brought against Israel, ultimately, the hope of restoration is rooted in God himself. If God has made a promise, then it will come to fruition. It cannot be thwarted by the disobedience of some. God's purposes for Israel will be complete, will be fulfilled. And when it came, ultimately, Judah, which takes the name, of course, of Israel, ultimately, in all the promises, when it comes out of Babylonian captivity, God takes up the nation again. And ultimately, he will bring them into a state of belief and they will recognize the one whom they crucify. They will mourn because of him, but they will recognize the king of glory. So it's just five parts. Let me just conclude. What lessons can we derive from Amos there? Well, the reason for the problems that Israel had was because of idolatry and false worship. Because of the fact that they set up alternative altars in the Northern Kingdom. And anything that comes between us and God should be abandoned. Avoid idols. You say, well, I, I don't have an idol in my house. So I don't have, you know, something made of stone in my house. But anything that comes between us and God Anything which comes, which prevents us from obeying the word of God, translating the word of God into our lives so that men and women see the reality of Christ in us. That is one of the big problems, it seems to me, of Christianity today. Men do not see Christ in us. Why? Is it because of idolatry? Is it because we're not compliant with the word of God? Is it because... We do not have an intimate relationship. That the worship that we have doesn't engage our minds, our hearts in a wholehearted way. You see, God still seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Secondly, one of the things which is evident through this New Testament, uh, this Old Testament text, is also evident throughout the mind of prophets, Micah in particular. There's always the danger that we can be guilty of abusing wealth, power, and privilege. James 5, have a read at James 5. 
Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for the miseries that are about to come upon you. And he lists all the problems about withholding wages from employees. And that's social injustice. And Christians can be guilty of that as well. There's always a danger that we can abuse power, wealth, and privilege. The third thing that Amos teaches us is to shun materialism. See, it's easy to forget the Lord in times of prosperity. We live in a fairly affluent society, do we not? Even as Christians, we get caught up in materialism. And if materialism comes between myself and God, then it's something that we need to set aside. Oh, it's quite pleasant being reasonably comfortably off. But that is not the point. You see, we can rely on material things and it displaces God from the throne of our hearts. And that's what happened to Israel. They said, well, we believe in God. We obey God's word. We are punctilious in the things that we do. We keep the feasts. And yet the hearts were far away from God. Why? Because they were materialistic in their views of life. Is that your concern, materialism? And finally, Amos is a man who is not prepared to be put off when it comes to preaching the word of God. He will not be thwarted. It doesn't matter whether he stands before kings. It doesn't matter whether he stands before priests. Whoever he stands before, he will preach the word of God. He will be instant in season and out of season to preach the word of God. And you will experience opposition if you preach the word of God. And this is what this man did. He had a commission from God. He was a man sent from God and he preached the word of God. Well, time is gone. The lion has roared. What is your response this evening to the prophet Amos?